so welcome everybody to this last uh, session of the workshop uh, Learn to Code in Gromax. So we will uh, start with a presentation of Berg on everything around coding, and then followed by a discussion. And then we have a small break, and then we have a round table where everybody can take a, a question that they have around Gromax. Some of those were raised already in the day before, so I have collected and can we can try to discuss those ones. Uh, so during the, the webinar will be recorded because then, then we will add to the playlist. The playlist is already active and I will post in the chat the link to the YouTube playlist. And then later the presentation of Berk will be, will be also uploaded and I will put also in the chat, in the chat I will also put the link to this presentation after I presented Berk. Mm. So during the presentation, Berk is willing to take questions, so please raise your hand or put the question in the Q&A, using the Q&A button. And so if you put in the Q&A button, I will, I will read it. If you raise your hand, I will unmute you. So we will try to do it in a very, and don't worry, I mean, Berk is happy to be interrupted and because it will cover all different type of uh, subject uh, topic, shall we say. Uh, I would like to say something about Berg. So Berg started to work on Gromax uh, uh, from his PhD, so before 20, 2000, sorry, before 2000. And uh, he was, uh, for all his career, from the PhD, from the postdoc, uh, from uh, associate professor up to full professor, he was always working in Gromax on Gromax and with Gromax, both of them. And the most things that he's proud of and uh, that implemented in Gromax is the, the domain the, the composition and uh, the accelerate and unbound kernels together that implemented together with Schiller Paul. Then he also contributed to Gromax with the Lynx algorithm and uh, with AWH. And also now is also one of the things he's contributing to is uh, the constant pH. So now I give you the word to Berk. Please, Berk. Thanks for the introduction and uh, nice to be able to present here. So um, yeah, it's a bit different now than last year when we were in person. So there was a room with, with a lot of people, um, especially for this talk, since this is touches many different topics. So it's, 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 it's nice to know what the audience would like to know more about or what to discuss. So. Um, but so, yeah, I said, please, uh, please interrupt if, uh, or ask questions along the line, because there are many different topics coming up here and I could go deeper into, into any of those. Um, so I gave this talk, the title, everything around coding. So you've heard already lots of technical aspects around coding and testing and, 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 and such, uh, but here there are many, I'll, yeah, I'll touch upon hopefully most other aspects involved in this, not so much on the coding itself um, of Gromax and, and scientific codes in general, since many points are quite general. So uh, um, I'll give first a historical overview um, or the whole, yeah, mo a lot, large part of the talk is actually historical to show how things evolved. Um, so a short history of Gromax development uh, to illustrate the professionalization of our code development, but I think we've been quite ahead of the curve in terms of scientific codes in professionalization. So this is in general, by, yeah, a good, a good overview to see what aspects you need to worry about as a code gets bigger or even for a small code, if you want to improve how it's being developed. Um, by now there, there, there are more codes, many more codes that uh, have more professionalized development, I must say. Um, then I touch upon communication between developers, the strategy of Gromax and APIs and, and challenges. So that's roughly the, the, con the content of today's talk. Okay, so let's start with history, some history. So Gromax, um, I joined in 1995 myself. So um, this is the states in 1995, before that, it started a few years before that. So Gromax originally was actually a machine as well as code. So that's why it's called Gromax, which is, was originally stood for Groningen Machine for Chemical Simulation. So nowadays our position is that there it doesn't have any meaning, but that was the original meaning. 
Um, and there was originally also a course called Grow Moss in Groningen, which was Groningen Molecular Simulation. Um, and that moved along with Wilfred van Gunster, which was the first PhD student of Hermann Berendsen, moved along to Zurich. Uh, so that was a Fortran code. And at that point, the group in Groningen decided they needed a, a more modern code that was parallel from the start and used C, which was very little used at that time. So this was quite ahead of the curve then. Um, so this also meant that, that Gromax was one of the first parallel and decodes around uh, also where that's quite ahead of the curve there. And that was because it was supposed to run on this or actually did run it when I joined on this special purpose uh, built uh, hardware. Uh, so that was many nodes connected in a ring, which was developed by the computer science department in Groningen. Okay, so I shared uh, uh, at that point a room with uh, three other, the, the three other main developers. So most people in the group worked on Gromax, but there were three people that did most of the work. I shared a room with those, so we had very short lines there. Um, and at that time, so we had at least, we had one thing already then, which was version control. So now I think nearly anyone is familiar with that. I mean, you people also use that for writing papers and such. So at that point we used CVS, there was no, no Git yet uh, then. Uh, so this was also quite quite ahead of the curve. And of course, uh, as you probably all realize, I mean, the version control is very important. So this was a, a big advantage, especially if you also, if you found bugs or so, you could go back and figure out when they came and, and what was affected. Um, so we already then tested the code on several different platforms. So Gromax now is known for being able to run on nearly anything. And already then we had many different platforms. So we had our special purpose computer that was x86. We ran on SGIs and there were, yeah, it was already pretty cross-platform there. Uh, so at that stage, we had no code review and we already had the very good manual, which got bigger over the time, the reference manual, but no development documentation. So that was roughly the state we were in um, in 1995. Um, so at that point, I'd say quite ahead of the curve, but uh, uh, not uh, uh, by far as professional as we are currently. So then if we look at how code was managed, so basically there was no management at all. So that actually held also for the scientific environment, which which by now, if I look back nowadays, starts to, to surprise me. So every PhD student had their own projects and goals. There was, I mean, I could do whatever I liked basically. Uh, so Hermann Behrens left everyone free as far as I know. I mean, I don't know about details of other students' PhD projects, how they were managed. I could do whatever I like and coding wise, we could also do whatever we like. So uh, there was self-organization there um, and there were no coding standards either. So people looked at code and then, yeah, tried to write things roughly the same way. So here's a, yeah, as, 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 as one example though, I mean, there's at some point someone learned about C++ and then they rewrote the tool in C++, which just resulted in being, making the tool completely unreadable because it just used C++ to make everything, yeah implicit and, and unreadable. So that's not a good idea. Um, but still, I'd say the code in general was of good quality and we had relatively good testing that read to reliable output, but it was all manual testing. So, um, but that set the stage for having a, a successful software project, um, even though most things were done manually. Um, but then as, as, as the team grew, issues started to arise. So we attracted many external contributors over the years. Um, likely because it was an open source project as opposed to many other codes. So uh, one of those was Eric Linda, who's currently one of the uh, main uh, names behind behind Gromax. So he came and visited us in Groningen for half a year. Um, and uh, this made our community larger and more people contribute uh, there. So as we can contrast with other MD codes that had communities mainly consisting of scientific co co collaborations and, and PhD students of the former code owner. So they're uh, of sort of the code owner. So they're often, there's one central person that manages the code uh, and decides who can contribute, whereas we had a, a more open system. So then of course you still need to have somewhat of, of a quality control. So I had been that implicitly for, for some years to, to judge if well if we wouldn't if we would want certain functionality at all in the code and then if the if the output is reliable and judge the code quality and these kind of things but as the community grew I mean this became uh, impossible there's too much work and also my career pro progressed so I had less time to to devote to this so we needed some some different setup than one person looking at the code and already that person 
uh, even being me uh, not not being able to do a good enough job on that. Um, so that leads to uh, the topic of management of scientific codes. So I'd say this is often pretty bad. So for many projects, it holds that there is no clear goals. There is no, no common standards. Um, and then still now, I mean, there's very often that if, if a new member gets into the, to the, to the team and they need to use the code, they need to figure out everything by themselves or they, uh, need to find uh, the PhD, a PhD student that has, has done a lot with the code and, and knows about it and can explain. So that's a, a, a not a good situation in terms of knowledge transfer um, and takes away a lot of time, both of the new people coming in and of the people that have been there that have to explain everything. So very inefficient. Uh, and then also it could actually be that code gets lost. I mean, uh, unusable if, if there's no one that knows about it anymore. Um, and then additionally, you can uh, scientific codes tend to grow with the number of features needed for every project. So if you put in every feature needed for every project, you quickly get an unmaintainable mess of code. So I've seen this happen to, to many other codes and also Gromax has had some of this. So it's actually very beneficial if you can throw out code uh, because code is a liability. It can, it can have bugs and needs to be maintained. So uh, it's good to have a selection and a priority of, of, of uh, but for that you need some, some goals of the project and where you want to go to be able to decide what you want in the code and what you, what you um, might want to exclude or throw out. So, uh, so these are, are, are challenging uh, issues, uh, not even only for scientific codes, for codes in general, but in science, it's, it's in particular problematic because of the the short time that PhD students and postdocs are there and the limited amount of resources. And, and additionally to that, I mean, there's no funding for code maintenance, which is a major issue, which is now being discussed at, at many levels in the scientific community to see how this can be solved. Um, okay, um, so then, what, what solutions are there for managing scientific codes? Well, uh, over my career, I've seen many codes, especially competing MD codes. I mean, they uh, uh, many of them got sold to a company, but that often means slow death. So a company would often, most companies just put an, uh, a nice shiny interface with, with buttons in front of the code and then just develop new buttons and don't care about the code and then the code will die. Also the question is if you can actually get money out of such a thing. So um, then there are codes that have uh, a still or yeah, there are fewer and fewer of those, but there were many over the last decades that have one PI that approves the code. So this is also slow death because this PI doesn't have a lot of time and might be also be old fashioned uh, in what 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 he or she wants into the code. So this could be, uh, yeah, this generally doesn't lead to a sprawling code development there. Um, but the third, the third solution is, is to embrace the community um, as we have tried to do with Gromax. So, uh, for this, you need the right tools to make a distributed community work, but then you can have many developers contribute there. So, of course, the issues are still there about to decide what should go in and what should not go in and so on. So that's still that's still a, a problem. But at least if you have a community, you can distribute this, you get more input and you have uh, distributed some more distributed uh, responsibility for things so that makes things scalable. Um, Right, I'll get back to, to, to some of the directions for Gromax related to this uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, so if we look at, at the tools that you need for this, so I think this has been mostly presented during the other presentations already, but I'll quickly go through it. So by now we have automated nearly every task that can be automated or standardized through tools, uh, which takes away a lot of the effort and also discussion like code formatting, there's Clang format. So if someone contributes code, we don't need to tell them, ah, this formatting is not good. You need to use camel case, whatever you need to use this. Our camel case actually we don't check, but uh, many other things, I mean, the, the formatting is automatically taken care of. So that's something we don't need to worry about. And it's very clear what the rules are and it can be automated. So that's great. Then testing, we do as much as we can autom automatic, but then, so we have the Google test framework for that, which I think has been presented. Um, and we have an old Perl script for a regression test that we want to retire, but we need to move our tests. So this automates the tests, but it, of course, it doesn't automate the writing of tests. So there's still a large amount of effort involved to actually nowadays, I think I would almost say it's more, more work to think about what you should test and how than actually writing the test itself. So the Google test framework is pretty nice and efficient, but you need to think a lot about how to test code efficiently and have sufficient coverage and think of the corner cases that could actually 
cause bugs if you test the, the simplest cases. I mean, those will usually work. So this requires a lot of effort still. Uh, but once your tests are there, then they they don't they don't cost any more effort apart from some some CPU cycles to run through the test. So this is a, a great improvement having automated testing. But I think that's a standard practice by now in in code development. Uh, then we have uh, why couldn't be present at, at all talks. So I don't know if this was discussed. But there's a static analyzer. Yes, I think I, I heard some of that. Yes, in. Uh, on this talk, there's a static analyzer to to check code logic, memory, uh, address, and uh, address sanitizers to to check uh, memory bugs, which is also very beneficial. I mean, a lot of bugs over the in the history of Gromax have been memory or yeah wrong address bugs, very typical. So many of those you can nowadays catch automatically, and then all this is tested and uh, checked and tested automated for every change uploaded to GitLab. So um, this takes away all of the effort here apart from writing the tests themselves. So this is great. So what we're still missing is automated validation testing at scale. So this is, is, is well, partially we need to write some, some scripts to do this and we need to have good test cases that actually we think would catch something. So that's something we need to do, which still costs some of our time at the release time. Um, right, so that covers all the testing. So then, um, yeah, on, on, on coding style, I mean, we had the code, correct code can be written yeah, in many, many, very many different ways. So we have some, some style guides. Those are available in the manual. This is not checked automatically, but it has, hasn't caused much issues. So I think also now we accept, I mean, we can accept code without this being much of a problem. I mean, there's some things about camel case and such rules, but um, nothing very strict. Usually if people look at other code, they'll find out how to, how to write stuff. So that works quite okay. Um, then if you actually develop code, there's in such a complex uh, package like, like Gromax, there's, well, apart from algorithms and such, but that's more numerical analysis or computer science. I mean, there's the, there's the, 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 the uh, a large part, I, at least I find, of, of, of writing new code and especially lar larger modules is how to organize this code. So if you have more complex features, you require more complex code. And that's often the case if you need to combine things or, or, or need to have different parts, different algorithms work together and such. So then you might need many classes. I mean, you could, of course, do something in one massive class, but that brings you back to the almost back to the old C times where we started in Gromax, where we had still have some ancient massive data structures around. Um, so then you get to the question, so how should my class be organized and how should they interact? So this, these are often very central kind of things and things that I, I tend to think about a lot and, and also others when they need to develop something new. So this is a one of the harder parts, and there's not also not not one solution. You can do things in many different ways. So then you have to just come up with what's the best way, which might not even involve only the current state of things you have, but you might also need to think think about the future, like what in the future, how would people want to extend these things, or how would they want to use the code written here? So, um, so that's uh, that requires a lot of thinking, and it's good there to be able to to discuss with others how one should organize such things. Um, then the, there's also a large issue when developing code is that often existing code is affected. And in Gromax now we have uh, some newer modules and we have some, some old ancient code. And the question is that often if you touch, if you need to interact with the ancient code, should that be refactored? Because yeah, that's, it's much easier to work with with modern C++ code that's much more modular and easy easy to easy to interface with. So the question is then should I refactor and I and very often we would like this to do but this to happen then yeah the question is how much can you expect from someone contributing there and also of your own time I mean how much time should you spend on implementing new things versus refactoring old code. Um yeah so here we need design design discussions of which we had some we should probably have have more so when people want to implement something new that we discuss and see What's the goal? What's their proposition for organizing this? How should things interact with each other? What other needs can we see here or what future use? So one can develop things that are future proof and extendable and maintainable. So these are, are hard kind of things, but can be quite interesting discussions, but you need to, uh, it's good here if there's people involved that that have some ideas here and that have some experience to come come with a good solution. Um, but these are hard, hard kind of problems. Um, 
Okay, yes, then I, as I already touched on, I mean, in terms of code reorganization, so Gromax is a combination of, 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 of messy legacy C code and newer, better organized C++ code. So, um, and then things are slowly moving. So uh, we've, we've, we've started moving to C++, I don't know by how long ago it is now, almost a decade, or maybe it is a decade. Um, so initially it was a lot of work refactoring a lot of code, but by now we've done uh, many of the important parts of the code. So now we really start seeing benefits as much easier to, to develop. So also I invest a lot of time in, in refactoring my own old, old code, which I think is one of my main things I should do in, in, in Gromax is uh, if I have time is to make sure that my old code is, is, is more maintainable and uh, better test covered and such. Um, so now we start seeing the benefits there that it's easier to develop, which is great. So. I also see the benefits of my own work I've put in there, which is often not fun refactoring old code, but uh, by now it's it's rewarding, it's rewarding us. So, but there's still one one I would I would like to know one major issue is the is the main MD loop which has become too unwieldy. So anyone having looked into how the main MD loop uh, loop and the force calculation structure is uh, will see that this is extremely complex and difficult. So this should be organized in a better way to have it maintainable and extendable. So that's something we need to work on, but that's extremely entangled and that's where many parts of the codes come together. So it's not, it's not easy to, to do that. And also in, we need to think of, of how this code will, would be used in the future to make it future proof. Um, yeah. So then one important question is, 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 is when to ask someone contributing new code to refactor existing code. So we can't accept only new code without refactoring old code because then things become unmaintainable. Like for instance, have, has happened out of the main and the loop. So one example here is, for instance, if we have uh, now the all the main uh, developers of, of CPUs and GPUs on board in Gromax or so NVIDIA, uh, Intel and AMD, and if they want to contribute new code to work for Gromax to work better on their CPUs or GPUs, then we ask them to do a certain amount of, of refactoring of old code so the things remain maintainable. So this has worked has worked quite well. So the the things have have slowly improved there, um, but then of course they need to coordinate what what should be refactored and, and who should design this this refactoring. So um, often the, the 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 people that wrote the original code are, are are no longer active in the project. So then you need to yeah for first figure out I mean how how was this code designed? How should it how should it look like? What do we want this to look like? How should we or organize it? So these are also um, yeah, this is no not fun, but it's rather important to keep the code maintainable because you can't just hack on stuff, keep hacking on stuff like the MD loop, which is now getting too complex. Um, so this is what happens with old code. So, but at least in Gromax, we're in a relatively good state. I mean, there are many scientific codes, especially I'm also involved in the applications in in fluid dynamics, and there most codes are Fortran, and then it's yeah, that's uh, it's pretty horrible. So there are people are 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 discussing in some codes, for instance, should we get rid of the common blocks and these kind of things. So I mean, we're at a far different level, but still there's lots of work to do. Um, okay, so let's switch now from um, the actual code development calls to things around this. So uh, if you are developing code, you need to you need to communicate to how to see how to do things, how to solve problems um, or work together with others. So therefore we have many communication channels. So I think here at the workshop, everyone is aware of, of all of these by now. So we have GitLab itself, where we discuss actual issues and we, we discuss uh, merge requests code that's come up. So we have the, the BioXL developer forum, where we um, have uh, discussions about uh, more high-level things. And we also announce meetings and, 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 and other kind of general announcements. And people can ask questions about new features and such. Then we have the, the bi-weekly Gromax Zoom call. So this is open to anyone. So this is announced on the developer forum and topics are requested by the participants. So we give an update here of the status of things um, in, uh, in Stockholm or in general development. And then people can discuss any issues. So this is nice to see people face-to-face, -face, although it's over Zoom. Uh, so you can have a face and a voice associated with things. So you can more easily ask questions if there's uh, discussions which are not very very code focused or so. This is a very good forum to to discuss and see what the opinions of others are and if people can help, for instance. 
And then there's Slack for, for shorter, quicker questions, uh, our Slack channel, which we're also using here in the workshop. So I think with these, we cover most of the needs. We have we have been discussing things that we before we had a mailing list, we changed to a forum, which we think is an improvement. But I think we have sufficient channels. We shouldn't have more than we have now. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so communication is, is important. So as I said for me, for technical discussions, but probably even more important is personal interaction. So if you if you work on, on on a project, it's good to know who the others are. And even though you're maybe not directly collaborating, I mean it helps. So as yeah, we had one for instance, one external developer says saying that the change went through much easier after he went uh, after he visited Stockholm. So then you know the person, and then I mean it's not that you then like him more or like to change more, but if there's a face associated with with someone, it's probably easier for someone just to click on a on a merge request in, in GitLab, say, ah, oh, this is from this person that came by. So it probably lowers lowers some barrier that's implicitly there. Um, but we've also had, on the other hand, uh, very large remote con uh, contributors or large contributions from remote contributors, but I said, like uh, Mark Abraham, who's now actually here. So he joined us after contributing from the other side of the world for several years. And Roland Schultz, uh, who's done a, a lot of work in Gromax um, a bit more than a decade ago, who actually came Came with uh, came to us for a postdoc for a year or so, but he's now working at, uh, also working at Intel actually, like Mark Abraham, he's in the states. Um, yeah, so it's important to 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 communicate not only for the content itself, but also to 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 know each other at least a bit, so you can associate faces with with people, and that makes things r run a bit smoother. Um, so unfortunately, this this workshop here is now on online. I mean, in terms of meeting people, but of course that enables more people to to join from different places further away. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, so tra uh, then we have a, a, a training aspect. So training of use of Gromax. So this is not the topic of this workshop, but it's of course important for, for code that people uh, know how to use it. So um, uh, tutorials are actually the most things the new users do to, to get to learn how to use the code. So we now have Gromax tutorials available on many topics um, directly now through by Excel. I should have put a link here actually to the tutorial page I see now, but there's also many tutorials around the world from, from different people that developed this. So this can be developed by anyone. So there's a lot of material. And then we have Gromax workshops, um, beginners workshops or on specific topics requested by organizers. And these are nowadays nearly always coordinated and sponsored by by, by Excel by the EU project. So like actually this developer workshop. But here we speak about use of Gromax. Um, yeah, so then to, uh, training for coding for Gromax. So we had a few developer meetings and now we, we have the second workshop here on learning to coding in Gromax, which uh, if it's a success, we'll continue doing this on a yearly basis. Then we need to decide if we want to have it only online or 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 alternate or something. We need to be to discuss that after this workshop has finished and we've evaluated this. Um, okay, so now we get back to direction of, of Gromax to, to see, to talk about challenges here in, in managing the Gromax project. So uh, maybe back, I just asked if there are questions because I see yes. that you change uh, topic. There are any yes. questions on what uh... What Berk spoke before, if someone maybe is thinking something, can I raise his hand? Oh, we can also have questions at the end, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can go on. Please. Yes, so um, direction. So um how one would ideally have a project is that you would have would like to have long-term goals guiding the overall development directions in a project medium-term goals so say for the next yearly release and then set short-term goals for features to get in, into a release yeah so this is would be very nice so you have a guide that you know where to go on different time scales so this could actually work in a company if you would have su su sufficient resources, but this tends not to work in, in for scientific codes. Um, so a strategy in scientific in science here, or or probably lack thereof, is that 
often you, I mean, scientists might have long-term plans, but they almost never have stable funding for those. So your long-term plans, I mean, how they work out depending on what funding you will get. So plans are usually not, cannot be longer than, let's say, three or four years, which is a, a funding project. Um, and uh, then this medium-term funding tends to be distributed over, over many projects also. So you can't focus exactly everything on one or or maybe even not even two long-term goals. Um, so that's a problem in terms of, of, of setting long-term. So of course you can still have long-term goals and try to um, align your projects with, with those goals, which is we try to do to a certain extent. But then also often, I mean, you, you, you can't set exactly what the strategy is of the funding agency. So they will might change direction or only want to fund certain things. Yeah, I should probably state here is that it's, 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 a, it's, it's nearly impossible in many in many calls to get for funding for for software development like here in Sweden for instance there's no money for software development so we get funding through EU projects which fund this or or uh partially fund fund such things so this is an issue in, in many countries is that you can get money for science for scientific uh, projects or maybe educational kind of things but not for not for code development so this is something also that the community is is quite worried about and thinking how to how to solve so we're in a quite, quite lucky situation with, with Gromax is that it's the the only major European MD code. So we we tend to get uh, into EU projects or ask for them because we are an interesting code there. So we're lucky in that sense. Um, but another, an, another issue is that the people, so yeah, you, you need people to go to code. You need smart people uh, that can do software development and, and those come and go as, um, well, naturally, because the funding is 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 is, is time limited, and we can't hire uh, many people um, permanently. Although we now have decided to hire one or two people permanently, um, but also those people they they might get much better offers from industry. So if they would want to go there, I mean, we've seen people go to industry. We've actually also seen people coming back because they they didn't like it too much industry. So that you can be lucky that it also also happens. But um, there's a flow of people, which means that. Um, um the knowledge there might go lost or well you lose some some part of the knowledge and 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 having to work people in can take like for a complex code like gromax can take a year or so for for people we would usually say it takes a year for people to be fully comfortable and, and productive so that's a lot of time to invest i mean it's money in, in invest in, in a person because you pay them whereas they're not not so productive the first year certainly the first half year but also it takes resources from from other people to to train this person. So there's a very big investment. Um, for these people themselves, it can be very, very beneficial because a, a complex software project like Romax is, is, is very good to learn and it's good for a CV. So uh, for the for the people themselves, it's it's not probably not a loss, but it's a gain. But for us as a project, this is a, a challenge. Um yeah, so then uh also if it's if it's actually scientific, so you're not just coding your coding project is not just an already known algorithm, but you're also developing science and the progress can vary a lot. And it's also not, not guaranteed. I mean, it can turn out that actually your, your, your scientific idea doesn't work, or it could be even that you have a good algorithm that its performance is bad on the, on the hardware, for instance. So this is also an, an issue. So it's not guaranteed that, that things will work out. Um, yeah, I said already the last point I went into this, if it's software engineering, it's difficult to fund. And, I haven't written here, I don't know if it's on the next slide, I mean, finding good people is actually the hardest part. So it's very difficult to find good software engineers, especially in a city like Stockholm, where there's a lot of competition from many companies that pay much more. Um, yeah, so this makes it very hard to plan and even hard to execute. So currently we're in a lucky situation that we have a reasonable amount of funding, but we actually have difficulty finding people to cover that. So that doesn't actually help them to have the funding. Um, but we have we have quite a few talented people that are assisting you here, so we have we're quite lucky that we have uh, the workforce we have to to work on the Romex project. Um, okay, so in terms of strategy, so we we don't really have have a long term strategy. Well, I have some ideas where we want to go. Eric has some, and some other people pro probably also. But it's always it's questionable how much you can you can execute there. So, but we can at least look at the medium term strategy. So here we have. Um, what we have done some some years ago 
or maybe a decade ago or so already, is to separate releases from from feature planning. So this is one way of 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 solving at least part of this issue of of having not having features ready in time because of for whatever reason, because of scientific issues or coding issues or whatever. So we have timed yearly releases, and what's ready goes in is our strategy nowadays, and this means that there's always a release, but we don't know ahead of time exactly what's going to be in there. So some features we might target for the, for a certain release, but if they're ready, they're in. If they're not ready, then they will be in next year. So, um, but this makes sure that releases happen. Otherwise, it can happen like with many codes and Gromax has happened in the past that you want not, do not have a release for two, three, four years because you're waiting for a feature, which means that any other smaller, smaller features that have been developed, they're not easily available to the user. Um, and the other strategy is to try to, to, to generate synergies between tasks in different projects. So we have many projects going on and uh, we can we should extract as much synergies as possible to reuse codes, to reuse things, or uh, yeah, we can try to make tasks um, help each other or, or maybe reuse complete things there. So this, this, this will generate synergies and uh, get things done quicker or maybe free up time for to work on other things. Um, yeah, so I mean, that, as, as you'd say, we don't, since we don't have a, a good, great long term strategy, I don't actually say anything about the content here, but this is basically the way the way we approach things now nowadays. Um, right, so then uh, talking about releases, uh, we, we realized later that we don't, we didn't exact, we didn't explain the other talks, we should probably do that next time, how our release schedule works and how things stick together. So I'll do that now here. So, um, so we have a yearly release cycle. Um, so development happens in the in the main branch. So all new code goes into into main uh, directly through code review, obviously. Um, then our strategy for fixing bugs is, is that bug fixes go into the current release branch, which is at this moment is released 2024. And these fixes come into the main branch by regular merges of the release branch into the main branch. So that way it's only fixed in one branch and then merged which usually doesn't cause too many issues. You can have co conflicts because something changed around the same lines in the main code, but it doesn't happen too often. Um, then if there are serious issues in of correctness in MD run, then they also get backported or we can fix them directly and depending on that that's not such a common situation. Uh, we fixed them in the, in the previous release branch, in this case, release 2023. And then um, we either cherry, cherry pick them or we merge them into there and merge that into release 2024. But that doesn't happen so often that we find issues that might affect your results you get from your run. Um, so this for this process here, so the, the, the yearly release actually requires a lot of effort, um, but it's mainly in terms of coordination and validation. So most of, the, most of these things have been automated, the release work, and we have, of course, our, our, our CI working continuously. So our code is usually in good shape, but still you need to coordinate what features you need to get in in, in which order, how to do the review. And then in the end, there's the, the validation left of that we haven't automated yet, as I mentioned before, I mean, larger scale simulations to check if some complex features work correctly and maybe newest hardware or so. Um, so that we need to work on automating. So there's still quite some quite some some time and effort going into that. And with a yearly release cadence is quite a lot of work. So. Uh, yeah, we've been discussing now and then if we could have it by uh, every second year or so, but then of course features get don't get out so fast. So at the moment we're still do, doing it yearly and trying to release the re reduce the amount of work involved in this. Um, as you see, I mean, there's also many 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 release branches to maintain here, but this is also nearly fully automated, so it's not so much work. <clears throat> um, but this work is covered by 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 Excel currently funding this uh, development work. Okay, yes, then we get to, to funding. So as I said, I mean, by Excel 3 currently, the third round uh, covers a lot of the code maintenance work, user different support and training like this workshop here. So we're very grateful for that. Um, then we have several other EU projects which involve Gromax development. So these are usually task focused, but they often produce code. So um, they might be targeting a certain uh, uh, area in science like uh, maybe automated or, or 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 better better drug development for energy calculations for those, but then this might need change in features or or scripting or performance improvements of 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 code. Um, we also have 
EU project targeting certain platforms or other things. So um, there's also quite some funding coming in from other EU projects. So then there's national grants, which some contain some algorithm development. So this is almost never direct funding for coding, but of course, if you develop an algorithm, it needs to be implemented. So we get some code from that. Um, then we have some universities outside of, of Sweden have people working on, on Gromax because it's an important code for them. So this is nice. So we get quite some contributions there. Also, uh, in particular, actually the, the Max Planck Institute in, in, in Germany, which is not actually a university, but a similar academic institute. And then we're lucky to have um, several companies working on Gromax. So at NVIDIA, there are about two to three people working on Gromax, maybe not full-time. Intel has one person at Intel, which is a Mark who's present here, and one person at KTH, which is Ante. Um, and AMD has one person here, which is uh, Paul, who's employed by AMD. So we're quite lucky to have a relatively large workforce working with Romex, but still it's not sufficient to, to do many. Yeah, we would like to do many more things and improve our code quality. Um, because the, yeah, so, uh, that's the next slide. I'll get back to that later. Yes. Um, yeah, so here we would like to, in academia, I mean, it's, 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 you would always like to achieve many more things than we actually can achieve. So that's of course, I mean, you should set high goals in, in, in science. Um, also I said, I mean, in, in addition, things can turn out to be m much more difficult than, than you thought, and you can have issues along the way. Um, yeah, so we have, as I showed on the previous slide, quite some resources, but they're still always understaffed. I mean, people tend to have too much work to do. So we have to be careful also with the people that we employ that they, uh, we don't ask too much from them because there's always more work than can be done. Um, and in addition, as I said, it's very difficult to find suitable candidates for propositions. So we can, that this, this in turn means that we can make very few promises on actually allocating resources to external projects if other people want to get code in. So this is a, a problem there. So, um, in, in general, we, if people want to contribute code to, to us, we will ask them to also give something back. And for instance, if, if for the hardware vendors, I mean, they have an obvious goal of, of making the Gromax run better on their hardware. So if they want to contribute code, for instance, we ask them to review uh, code, related code um, coming in. So we we don't get the burden of and having to maintain more code and, and having to review their code coming in. And we also can also ask them to 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 refactor old code that we have to keep things maintainable. Um, so this is actually for for vendors maybe works a bit easier because they have soft actual so, soft, software engineers that are familiar with this. This can be somewhat harder for uh, contributions from Thai scientists that often don't have uh, the software engineering skills uh, on the level that we use here here. Here in Gromax, and we can't expect that either from from scientists directly. So this is this is another challenge, as the code development development uh, gets more professional, it gets the barrier for contributing increases. So that's also why we have a workshop like this to to uh, to learn people how to how to contribute and what's involved here. Which, as you've probably seen by now, is is there's quite a lot quite a lot involved uh, here. Um, yes, yeah, so then. Uh, some lists here, just an overview of, of external contributions that we have gotten over the years, um, where it starts with, yeah, the SIMD non-bullet kernels contributed by Eric. So that's, I mean, it's in external in the sense that, that Eric wasn't in, in Groningen at that time. Um, but, well, he was maybe visiting, so but that's got into the main code, PME also by him. So then we have many a, a list of many other um, different different features that have come in over the decade was actually a large one is the analysis framework contributed by Temu Murtola, who's no longer involved in development. Um, and then as we go to the, to the right hand side of the list here, we see things actually being implemented through the MD modules API, several of them, which has been a, a major help in improving things like the QMM interface is one of the first things that went through the, through the new MD modules interface. So this is a, makes the things very modular as, instead of the old interface, which was hacked in and you had to hope every year with a new version that things still worked. So this is a, a major improvement in portability and makes things much easier. Then this MD module face, interface has been extended and has been used to interface with Colvars. So this is uh, an effort by Jean Hennen, Hubert, who's here, and uh, Giacomo Fiorin, who's also here. 
So this has been a great success in, in extending the API there and making it uh, fully functional uh, to interface with, with goal VARs. So this is a uh, great progress and makes the, the API more usable as well. And we've seen this because Plume noticed this goal VARs effort and they decided to also interface Plume through the same mechanism. So that's in progress now and uploaded as merge requests. Um, so this, uh, this makes it easier. I mean, both for, for, for Gromax and also for the, for the, for the, um, for the other, uh, package involved to keep things compatible and make it, keep it running. So, and, and for the users, especially, I mean, things like Plume, they, they're hacked in. So it's difficult for the user to, to set it up. So this has all been, is now fully automated and streamlined. So this is a great progress. Then we had, uh, yeah, we have the many, uh, uh, we have the GPU acceleration for different um, backends, different hardware um, or compute models um, contributed from the vendors. So that's also been a, a great success in, in co-design interaction there. Uh, then we have one problematic case, which is the Python API. So the, I'll get to APIs um, uh, in the next few slides. So. APIs are are very important by now, so we're 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 uh, somewhat behind there. So, for instance, um, OpenMM is very popular because it has a, a very usable API. So, uh, because of this importance, there is uh, Eric Ergang, who was funded by Peter Kassen from the US, um, has had developed a, a Python API, which in Gromax, but this was unfortunately hacked on in a certain extent to a certain extent because the internals of Gromax certainly at that time were still old fashioned and it was just written for to 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 start a run going uh yeah running md run starting by reading a tpr running a simulation and quitting so this is it wasn't at all structured to 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 put an api on top of this so this meant that the api uh, was somewhat contorted and had to work around all these all these issues so this is a, is really a pity because this is extremely important to have to have a python api but its functionality is, is rather limited because of the way Gromax was structured. So this is improving now, but we need to do something here to make a usable API. Um, then things, yeah, so I, I also list the constant pH code here that, that I've worked on together with my collaborator, Gerard Groenhoff. So this will also go through the MD modules and be linked in, but will probably not make the next release, but the one after. But now there's finally progress on refactoring this. That is actually a nice example here. So this constant pH code has been ready for at least two years but it hasn't gone in yet because of the software engineering effort. So it's almost as much work to, to refactor the code, to have it, make it in a, put it in a maintainable shape and test coverage to write the original code, unfortunately. So there's a lot of effort, extra effort needed, a software engineering effort to, to have maintainable, sustainable code. And then there's many analysis tools contributed, which Many of them are being ported now still to this framework that Tamo would allow me, so that's nice. Um, right, so this is a list which, which will keep grow, uh, growing, especially as, as as more people join and things become more, more modular. Um, so then, um, before I get to APIs, uh, I just want to make clear, probably I mean people developing code are aware of this, but code is a liability. So code is not, you want to have features, you don't want to have code. So Gromax is about 750,000 lines of code. Oh, so there should be lines there on this first line, it's missing. Um, and, and we read somewhere that, that one person is, is needed to support about 5,000 lines of code, which is probably some rough estimate, but I don't think it's it's too far off. So we would need about 10 people only for code maintenance. And I think that's actually, is probably a reasonable, a reasonable guess. So that's not for developing new code, but just maintaining the code there is. So that shows you how much effort you need just for maintenance of such a code in principle. Um, so I said, yeah, in, in academia, people often disappear and so on. So we want we want features and performance. We don't want to code. So actually we want to have less code is, is always better, right? But you won't still want to have features. Um, so again, I mean, this is why full unit and module and regression testing is always important because that means that you can at least check if all these 750,000 lines of code, if they're still correct and operating together in the right way. Um, Right, so actually we don't want to have code, huh? so that's that's uh, uh, we want we might want features, but not the code. So uh, yeah, this 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 just goes back to 
things I said before, so I don't need to spend much time here. So as we uh, we automate most checking of this code, uh, we have coding guidelines to limit the number of C++ features so we don't get too complex code or, or diff difficult contracts. So we, I think yeah, it is already pretty difficult. You need quite some C++ knowledge to understand many parts of the code, but we we don't want to use all features in particular, not to make things too complex and difficult to understand. Um, yeah, there's still many particular organizational aspects of the code that can be handled different, better or worse. Um, so we strive for high code quality, but we should not have too high requirements, especially for new contributors, since then it's very difficult for, for people to get in. So you need to have some balance there. Um, so I'd like to train people to, of course, to, to, to learn how to write high quality code, but yeah, we, we, we shouldn't say to people, I go away because your code is not good enough. So, um, that's not helpful. Uh, certainly not for the people contributing, but also not for us in the end. So we need to find a balance there. Um, right. So then that brings me to, um, APIs, which are kind of a solution to everything here. So, uh, so on the one hand, there's the, the, the user facing API for which we currently just have the Python API. So here it can be very beneficial to have access to, to such an API for setting up simulations and a workflow. So you wouldn't need any bash scripting and, and you can ideally also get better performance if you have many operations you want to do in simulation. So by now, I mean, I hear more and more people ask for, for things where they can manipulate, put in molecules or move molecules around and do things easily to uh, have some workflow there. Um, so if, if this is done well, things can also be more efficient, but also, I mean, it's much nicer to have a Python Python script and run, have some bash script calling programs where all kinds of things can go wrong. So uh, error control is also much, much better handled in such cases. Um, so this we need to work on. We don't have, we have the, the GMX API, but it's, uh, yeah, it's problematic because of the reasons I said before. Um, so, but for developers, there's uh, a lower level API. Um, and here it's is in terms of of code development and maintenance it's there are important implications so if you have an api and a feature links into that then there's clearly separate responsibilities so uh this would this standardizes the interaction of modules with the rest of the engine so this actually is beneficial also for internal code in gromax we want to refactor that all the special algorithms they use for instance the md modules api so it's clear what they need from the code when they need it at what point and which modules are active and which not is much easier to determine if it's fully standardized than if like now many of the modules, they just get called at a certain point in the code and they do their thing. But then you, yeah, you don't know what they depend on in terms of other things being, being done at what time and so on. So this makes the responsibilities very, very clear. Um, so an API should not be changed, but can be extended. So uh, that means that for people having external features, they will keep working. Like for instance, now the the Colvars interface or in the QMMM interface we have, I mean they'll they'll keep working in newer Gromax versions without any effort. So this is this is great, and there's no issues internally anymore when we re, when we re refactor something. So if you change something in Gromax, then things will keep working. Like we had the issue with Plune, for instance, that that interface with Gromax is that they some things went wrong if you had computational on GPU because Gromax wasn't aware that Plune was plugged in. So coordinates on CPU might be outdated, for instance, so you can have such dangerous kind of effects. So, whereas if you do this through an API, then the API would signal clearly that the coordinates are needed on CPU to call whatever module. So the coordinates are up to date. Um, and this also, in terms of separating responsibilities, this makes external contributions much more easily managed since they can be managed externally. So there's, since the, the needs on Gromax go through the needs on the API, which are clearly specified, uh, the module itself can be fully managed externally. So the, the Gromax core development team doesn't need to worry about the module at all. It just needs to worry about the API keeping working. So that's uh, very beneficial for, for, for both parties in such a case. Um, yeah, so also that, that separates responsibilities, not in terms of only in terms of maintenance, but also in terms of of developing, so if we've had over the over the decades, many people come in. I want my algorithm in Gromax. What's needed for that? So, but if we have an API, then um, you don't need to ask the question anymore. That can I put put my functionality in? But it's just a question: Does the API support all the needs of my functionality? So, if that's not the case, then we can discuss. Well, if this is the case, it's already solved. Of course, you can write your module. Um, 
in terms of an MDU module and it will work and keep working. But if something more is needed, then we can discuss like what needs to be added to the API. So that's a, a much simpler and more focused discussion than discussing all the contents of the module. You can say, well, I need access to this extra thing or I want to modify that. And then we can see like, yeah, can we make that happen in the API? Is that something we want? Um, so then, yeah, so also yeah, having functionality in external modules means that they can be maintained separately. So this means that, uh, yeah, as I said, the, 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 there's no increasing burden on the on the main Gromax team in this anymore. So this means that we can have many, many, many more modules working um, without needing more manpower on the core on core Gromax. So this is a, a major benefit. And we see that happening now already with, for instance, Plumed moving to any module. I mean, this is a benefit, a benefit for everyone for the for the Gromax developers, the Plume developers, and for the for the users. So this is a very beneficial way of moving forward. Um, so the challenges with APIs is 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 where to start. So uh, on an API, so if you don't have one yet, so we currently don't have an API expert. So this is uh, a major issue for the for the for a new Python API we would want to have, or a modification of the of the of the of the current Python API. Um, so we don't know where to start exactly, and we don't we for, for before starting especially user facing api i mean you need to have very good overview of what the strategies could be what the best strategy is there um so that's a that's a challenge but i think the main challenge here is to actually hire find someone that's an api expert that we can hire to work on this um then the other challenge is that uh, old code often needs to be re refactored to enable a simple api i mean you might need to be able to 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 take take a, a state of the system coordinates velocities whatever all the parameters then run run a few of these steps come back let, allow the user to modify something and run again but then it means you need to go up and down the call stack without memory leaks without breaking stuff so this has been improving a lot over the last decade and I think by now it's nearly possible that we haven't tried yet so many things will still pop up but I think we're we're getting close to the point where this is possible so then we could actually build an API on top of this that also has not only has the benefits of being a Python API, but also has performance benefits of being able to keep things in memory. Um, yes, then the question is, the very tricky question, if you get more technical, if you want to change the parameter, I might want to change the temperature or whatever of my system, then the question is which which other parameters or which internal states of the whole machinery get affected by this. So that's also a big challenge. I mean, up to now, Romax has been designed, like you generate a TPR file, with GrumPP, the whole all the parameters are fixed, and then you run MD run. So you can assume in the MD run machine here that all parameters are fixed. But if you're allowed to change things, then you need to make sure that there's no outdated copies of of parameters lingering around somewhere, which is a, a big challenge. Um, but as I said, we're slowly moving forward there. So. Um, right. So then uh, some a note on accelerating the effects of an API. So we've we've seen already that that with the MD modules API is that if there's some basic API present, then things go quickly. So then both the users of the API and developers can play around. Um, new needs become clear, uh, like we've had discussions with the with the Plume people, also with others in uh, some Zoom calls to see what what needs there could be, uh, how we could extend things. So uh, once there's something there, then then We've seen you can you can generate a small community around that and and things things tend to happen so that's great so then uh, uh, things become more useful more excited and more people can can join so this is a a nice accelerating effect so uh, which is already happening with MG modules so I think we should start this with the with a Python API Python user facing API as well and see the same thing happening we are read I've spoken to to many people that have needs here so that's looking that side is looking good. Um, Right. So then, some 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 final general notes on Gromax. So Gromax has has we don't know how many users it has thousands, probably tens of thousands of users worldwide. So it's impossible to keep track of of all of these. Um, so we use we use polls to get an idea of their needs, but then we just get a few hundred answers. So that's not the question is always how representative is that of all the users worldwide. Plus, it's difficult in a poll to get detailed. Answers, I mean, of especially about future needs of how things might look like. I mean, that's much better to talk to people than you can't talk to so many people at the same time. So Gromax probably has hundreds of developers worldwide, but we interact with, with we know very few and we interact even with less of them. So 
now and then I, I meet people say, ah, oh, I have code for Gromax, but they have it. They just use it themselves or in their group. So we don't know. Most likely, likely we don't know about most of the developers and we don't know what their needs are either. So this is a challenge here in such an open source project um, that uh, it's difficult to, to see what the needs of the community are. So we know the needs of the people we talk to, but not we don't know the needs of the people we don't talk to. Um, yes, that was my final slide. So this talk covered many aspects, not all. Um, so now there's time for questions on, on anything.